So this guy, he was on last year. His name is Craig Sullivan. Uh, and and um, it's basically, my hotline is, you know, if I, I know some stuff about conversion optimization. If I, if I kind of hit the wall and I don't know what to do, then I call Craig, because he always has the answers. He, he's like the most knowledgeable, kind of widespread uber optimizer on the planet. Uh, and basically, if you're doing conversion optimization, you need to be packing. You need to have like a, a good toolkit, a bit, like a tool case about this size for all the stuff. So now we only looked at copywriting, but, but Craig's going to give you an overview of, of basically uh, all of the tools you need in half an hour. So uh, yeah, this is going to be this is going to be tough for you. Guys. Welcome, Craig. Good morning, everyone. Um, that was a great speech from Brian. I, just, uh, I had one thing to add to it. Um, I've done over um, test, uh, split tests with over 40 million people now, and I can tell you one thing, absolutely stone cold fact. Copy is the biggest element of the lifts that I got on those tests, at least 50%, sometimes as high as 70 or 80% of those lifts that I'm getting in those tests come from reworking crappy copy. So pay attention to the words, not the visual layer. Think about the reaction that your copy causes in the mind of the viewer, not what your boss thinks or what the right thing is to write. You'll make lots of money that way. Anyway, thank you, Brian. So what am I gonna to cover today? Just um, a very quick rundown of the key tools that myself and other conversion optimizers are using to kind of yank some value out of our work. Um, I'm not going into sort of visual elements or how to put the pages together. This is just a very fast roundup of some of the tools that you should be using or trying to use in your sites to get better conversion. A little bit of history. I, I started doing all this kind of uh, mixing UX and analytics and split testing way, way back, like a long time ago in e-commerce terms. And I then did my stint as a startup with Love Film, growing um, that company considerably. And then for four years, I joined a company called Belrod, who nobody has ever heard of, right? It's just one of those weird companies that no one knows the brand name for. You will know them as Carglass, or in the US as Safelight. These guys are pretty big. Um, and they own all of these brands. It was a lot of fun work. Um, I also got to build a huge team of people to look after this massive global operation. And we did this stuff. Oh, a font problem. Uh, we looked after this stuff too. We looked after this stuff as well. We had a pretty big brief, this, this huge team that we were building. And we looked after over 40 websites uh, and over a billion euros of revenue solely from the online channel, you know. So, yeah, we need a lot of people. No. Eight people. And it, it just goes to show you that you don't necessarily need a huge team of people to do this stuff. You've just got to have the right mentality and uh, agile, iterative, user-centered and data-driven is the way to go for this stuff. If you have a small tight team that's focused around those things, you can do things that teams of 30 or 40 simply cannot hit the spot on. One of the fantastic things though was, foolishly, I decided to give all of that up, all that team, and completely get out of my <coughs> comfort zone and go into pretty hostile territory in some cases. But the great thing over the last eight months is I've gotten to work for all of these brands and more and it, it's been an eye-opener for me because I've been seeing a lot of analytics configurations and broken stuff in different companies and um, you know it just it just goes to show the problems that I was seeing in one place they're completely different everywhere but there's a lot of similarities and these these tools that I'm going to show you today are really hands-on stuff. This is practical stuff, it isn't expensive. A lot of these tools are free or really cheap to acquire. Um, you should have budget for all of this stuff. So there's no excuse not to be using it. And these are the things that I'm gonna cover. I'm just gonna go straight into this. So, session replay, what is this? Well, it's a, it's a way of recording the mouse movements, the clicks, and on mobile devices, it's being able to record the gestures, the taps, the, 
the, the scrolls and flicks that people actually use in these devices. So this is kind of like having lots and lots of usability tests continually running on your site. You're making little videos all the time of people using products. And for me, this is vital, this stuff for optimizers, because it gives me stuff that no other tools will give. So if you get nice data from analytics, nice uh, insight from user testing, this is kind of a bridge between the two. It's a very rich source of data on visitor experiences. You can also do some wonderful things like say, hey, give me all the people that use Safari and left my conversion funnel, or all the people that clicked on this, or all the people that did or didn't do a particular action that I'm interested in. And you can even use this stuff to optimize in real time. So at Bellron, we would launch features from the site, and 15 minutes later, we would be watching videos of people using the new widget, which meant that we could have more comfort when we put something live that it was actually working. And that led us to be braver in product deployment. Um, this is a pretty good thing. So it's, it's a multi-purpose tool. Um, these two at the top are, are come up quite a lot and people have been using them a lot. Session Cam is a new one on the block. I actually find it very, very simple, easy to set up. Um, and uh, I was getting high fidelity recordings or, uh, from that within about five minutes of setting it up. So these aren't difficult things to configure. They're not really expensive to purchase and they'll give you a secret sauce that nobody else has got. Um, so it really taps you into things. A couple of little examples. If you have um, a site where you know, you're kind of thinking, some people say this, the, the, the fold in web design is a myth. It's not a myth uh, as far as conversion optimizers are concerned. Particularly, on, say a good example is on product pages. If, you, if your visitors are not seeing your add to cart or add to basket button above where their fold line is, you are gonna get less sales. It's just, it's a no brainer. And in this particular case, Clicktail here is showing me that 99.2% of visitors who looked at this page can actually see the freaking button. Um, that made a huge difference because when I was looking at that page originally, it wasn't converting, and that's because there's all this white space around the button. People didn't see that there was a button there, and they didn't see that there was one beneath. So, pretty important. Um, also, uh, session replay tools, um, this is another example from Clicktail, will tell you where people are clicking that doesn't work. So if you have a load of images on your page or things that look like links and people are going click, 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 click all the time on them, you want to know about this, but it won't be in any of your data. No one's going to ring you up and say, I noticed an image on your website that looks clickable but isn't. Things like this do not happen in real life. Um, one last thing on the uh, session replay. If you have a long form content site, if you've got a lot of pages like this and, and you want to know exactly how far people are reading down these pages on particular templates, these session replay tools will give you an idea of the amount of attention your content is getting and how far people are reading down. So these are all examples of things that you won't get from other tools, so very vital. Now feedback and, and voice of customer tools are pretty important as well. And one thing that people think about these is, oh, this is having feedback across your entire site. But for me, as a conversion optimizer, it's not about general site feedback, it's about specific stuff. You know, if you have a retail store and you're sitting there and people keep coming in, they look around, and then they walk out of the front door, what do you do? Do you just say, oh shit, you know, people don't like the store? Or, after a while, you would actually go to people who are leaving and you would say to them, was there something you were looking for? Can I help you find it? You know, are, you, are you after buying something specifically? And they would say, yeah, yeah, I, I came to look for beds, but I can't see any. Oh yeah, our, our beds are in the back here. Let me take you through. So, voice of customer tools could be used to ask people who are leaving or who are not completing an action why it was that they did it. I mean, it's kind of obvious, like, Ask people and they will give you information. So this is a really, really cheap way of actually getting behaviorally triggered feedback on your site around a specific area where you're having problems with. And one last little tip here. If you've got a sales team or a call center, take them out for beers and get them drunk. And then get them to tell you what is wrong with your online operation. Those guys know 
but there are layers of management to make sure that you never ever find out and beer will solve this problem before the end of the night they will be bitching so much and you will be learning so much you'll and all of you will have forgotten it all the next day there are some good examples here um, even if you don't have the budget to actually buy any of these packages for with 4q for some tiny clients that i work with some small charities this allows them to get feedback from 100 people saying what they could do on the site. Um, so there's, there's no barrier there. If you're not doing surveys, either generally with your customers, there's a long-term customer satisfaction program or some way of getting uh, information on you and your competitors, um, you really should be using these. And I've used SurveyMonkey, I'm not a big fan of it. My favorite one is SurveyGizmo. This is the Swiss Army knife of survey tools. It's completely customizable. If you want to use all your colors and branding and fonts that your corporate website has, you can do it all in Survey Gizmo. And if you do anything at all with web forms, I have one really important piece of advice. Please get hold of and read anything by these guys, Caroline Jarrett and Luke Rublewski. Luke Rublewski is the god of forms in the world. He's also a very good guy on mobile, but he taught me everything I needed to know about to optimize forms for conversion. He has a very good book, he has a great website and resources. Honestly, read this guy and you will be 10 times better at fixing conversion funnels and lead gen forms. He's, he's very, very good. When I use these guys' advice to create the international customer satisfaction survey for uh, Carglass, we were able to um, uh, write this and get a really good result, which was we got 35% click-through from the email and our form completion rate for the customer satisfaction questions, this is nine questions on different pages, 94%. We only lost 6% from our funnel. That is the best result I am ever going to get. I will never ever beat it, but it was, it was very nice. So it's a killer app, that. <coughs> Now here's an interesting one, out of all those clients that I showed earlier on, there's a huge proportion of them whose sites are broken. They don't work on browsers. I've heard all the bullshit excuses. The developers have tested that stuff. We test the most popular browsers. It's a lie unless you can prove it. It's just an assumption. We think we've tested. It's not true. Email. If your emails are not rendering and you can't see them properly and they don't look right on the device that's sending, what was the point of sending the email in the first place? You are wasting electricity and bits on the internet. Stop doing it. It's not green. Please. Um, test your emails. The Litmus has got some very good stuff. It's very cheap. So do these other guys. Um, if you're doing any work with split testing, you will often find that sometimes when you implement an A-B test, it doesn't work in one browser. You need to be able to QA test your site. A great deal of the e-commerce retailers that I've worked with this year had huge browser bugs in their site. One of them was worth eight million pounds a year, just from two days work of fixing it. No one's gonna ring you up. You, you're not gonna, if you're not looking at the data, you might not even know that you've got a problem here. So don't assume that somebody else is testing this stuff. Make someone have the job of testing it and making sure it's worth money. Cross-browser testing is pretty good and that's the one I'm using most of all at the moment. And last but not least, if you're doing any work on mobile, try and get one of these mobile device rental systems. You can rent a mobile phone in California if you want. And it will remote control it, you can install apps on it, send text messages, look at Google Maps on it. You're actually controlling a phone that's on the other side of the world. And uh, this costs from $40 an hour. It's really cheap. If you want to test devices that you can't, you can't afford to go and buy 200 phones to keep in your office. I mean, it would be really cool. But uh, my boss isn't going to spend all that. So what I do is I rent the ones that I need for the $40 an hour, and deviceanywhere.com is a great example. Zero budget testing. Most people make a choice. Should we do usability testing, or should we not do usability testing? It shouldn't be that kind of simple and that kind of a naked choice. So 
Here on here are some low budget testing tools. All you need here is a laptop with a web camera and a piece, one of these pieces of software and you can go out to a bookshop, a coffee store, you've got your own portable usability lab right here. And this one, Cam Studio, is absolutely free. And this one from MediaCam is about 40, 45 euros. So really cheap. And they will record the person's face, uh, they will record the website, and they will record the audio. So the whole session. Normally you have to pay a lot of money for these, but uh, those two are particularly cheap. There's a couple of examples for Mac there. If you're doing mobile and you want to record what's happening on the mobile screen, there's this uh, app for um, iOS called UX Recorder, which will record what's happening in the session. <coughs> and also there's this um, thing called Reflection, which will send what's happening on the person's screen being tested to another room so you can record it there. These are very, very good. Have a look at this stuff. It, it's really helpful if you want a natural testing environment. You know, you want to sit someone with a tablet on a sofa, not sort of sitting up in a lab with all these cameras trained on it. It's actually a really good way of getting more naturalistic behavior from people in uh, usability testing scenarios. And here's one that's not talked about very often. Um, the team at Belron that I was working with, all distributed around the globe in terms of the marketers that we were doing this work for, these guys didn't have meetings all the time. They had uh, one meeting a week, uh, one meeting a year of that entire team. And uh, the total sum meetings that we had in that optimization team at Belron were one 15 minute meeting a week to discuss the development priority. So, how are we planning a whole week's work in 15 minutes? We're not. It's because the work is happening in the rest of the week. Stop having <coughs> meetings. You know, meetings are just uh, meetings with time-wasting morons. Um, is, is sucking your time from your diary. And you need more time to actually do that elusive thing called real work. Um, these are the tools that help glue this stuff together. Most of you will have heard or known about Basecamp. I mean, it's a pretty good high-level kind of project management tool. Um, but some of my killer ones are, this one is the top tool. I tell everybody about this. Within 25 seconds, you can be screen sharing with anyone in the world. It doesn't need a software installed. You don't need to register. It's the ultimate conversion because it's totally free and nobody at the other end needs to install any software. And you know when you have that conversation, you say to somebody, oh, let me just show you on the screen, it's easier. It's like that, but for people who are not in the same place. So, uh, totally free product there, go and get this one. Some of you may have used Trello, which uh, is actually very good for sort of task management, and uh, certainly I know some development teams are working on uh, using this product to actually deliver stuff every week. This is the killer one for me. This is what glues together all the agile and lean work done at Bell One uh, across multiple project streams. This is a, a project management and task management tool that's specifically built for this kind of environment. It's absolutely brilliant and very cheap. And then you can do other things. There, there, are, there are online apps here that will let you design flowcharts or wireframes with several people working at the same time. So you get a conference call and then you can all work on this like you were in the same room. If you have a new design or a mock-up that you want people to comment on, well, put it onto one of these and then let people put sticky notes on it like they were in a meeting room. And one of my favorites here is Concept Share. You can, you can scribble, you can add notes. It means that maybe 10 or 20 people around the world can uh, be adding all their comments to a design and you don't then have to pull all this out of all their emails. It's all being put in one place. These are the kind of tools that help glue together this work so that people don't have to be in the office. They don't have to go to meetings all the time. You should make this stuff happen outside of that. And split testing tools, this stuff is cheap or absolutely free these days. I mean, back in 2005, I was paying £6,000 a month for a software license to do this stuff. Now you can do it for £0. <coughs> Google Content Experiments is great, but it's also got this very clever thing built into it. It's called the Multi-Armed Bandit Algorithm. And what this does is, if you feed it three different creatives, A, B, C, 
it will actually work out which creative is working for which people at which times of the week. So if it knows that the, the picture of the lady works best on the weekends, then it's going to replay the picture of the lady on the weekends. So it's a self-learning machine algorithm that will actually test out stuff and then adapt. And this is the future of testing. This stuff is early days yet. There's a product called Conductrix that I'm looking at and another one from a company called Reco. These solutions promise to take a lot of the boring and hard work out of testing and get results faster. So read up on this stuff, multi-armed bandit algorithms, because this is kind of the future of testing for me. Not quite here yet, but real soon now. And the two that come up all the time, I've been using Optimizely a lot this year. I really like it. It's got a great UI, um, and the product support has been excellent. And a lot of you will probably already be familiar with this product. Then a little bit about performance. This is one that doesn't get talked about. People find it really boring. I, I like having conversations with people about performance, but most people can't stay awake when I'm doing that. Um, this is actually a picture of two slugs fighting. It may actually be just like your mobile website. So if you possibly can, if you've got Google Analytics, then you will have Google site speed. Right? Make sure you look at this data because it's a real measurement of how long your pages are loading for real customers. It's not a simulation, it's actual data collection. And these two here, web page test, will do desktop web pages. And this free service from Akamai is absolutely brilliant for mobile. So here's a little example. Um, this might be why IKEA's uh, conversion rate on their mobile site sucks like a planet-sized lemon spinning in space. And, <laughs> But the problem is, is that these people are all looking at their mobile sites in their office on Wi-Fi connections. Oh, it's great. It's lovely, our new site. No, it isn't, because I'm out in the street and I'm trying to load an IKEA site. I have to load nearly a megabyte's worth of data into my mobile phone. And, and you know, ubiquitous 4G isn't here yet. Um, but this column is very interesting because it's not just about the size and kilobytes of this download. It's also about how the page renders and how many page requests you make. See if you're making 145 page requests on your mobile phone, it's like, oh, I'm going to get that, I'm going to get that. It's going to take a long time. That introduces the delay into the load time. So it's not just how big the page is, it's about how the page actually builds and how many parts there are. This tiny little site here, Autoglass, and indeed all the car glass mobile sites around the world, their payload is 25k. This mobile site is taking a huge amount of revenue. It's probably over 500 million pounds a year now from a thing that's 25k in size. Go figure, IKEA. <laughs> and if you really care about this stuff and you need something to convince the boss to invest in performance, download this deck, right? This deck is absolutely brilliant because it contains this data. These guys, when introduced a delay, on the mobile site, what would happen to our mobile site if we made it really, really crap and slow by adding half or one second of delay into all the page requests? Well, what they saw there is they, they saw that, you know, if you're a content site, that's 10% less page views. Uh, your conversion rate has gone south by 3.5%. Your bounce rate has increased massively. And you know, your, your cart size has gone down, so you can put a small delay. If you flip this around and think, what happens if we made our site half a second faster to load, or one second faster to load? Could it be worth these kind of sums of money? And here's, a, here's an interesting one for a, any e-commerce people. This top line here, the purple line, is for people who didn't have any delay introduced. And this blue line here is the, is the one second delay. And this is actually the returning visitors percentage, the lifeblood of any e-commerce site. So by having a slower site, what you're missing out on is this gap between this blue line and this pink line is either competitor beating or it's the death of your company. So if you're not investing in performance, you, 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 you really need to look at that deck, use the stuff in there to convince your boss and start making things quicker because it will actually make you a lot of money. It's a good conversion optimization tip. 
Now, if you want to get some feedback from people, but you don't necessarily want to pull people into a lab, why don't you crowdsource it? Why don't you use some of the visitors and people that are coming to your site every day to get them involved, to get them to look at mock-ups, to get them to run a short usability test? It's a really great way of getting fast feedback. So, for some of my smaller clients, I've been using this service from usertesting.com, which costs £30 per participant. I mean, it's not really expensive. So, each time I iterate a product, I can get feedback from three, four, maybe five people. And it costs me an awful lot less than a lab-based test that might be, you know, eight, ten, twelve thousand pounds. So, the, there's no excuse here. There are some great crowdsourcing tools to get feedback on new designs or your current website, and there's a complete list of them there. Um, one last little thing here, one, one very interesting little thing. There, there are um, telephone call tracking solutions out there, but there's a really cheap way that you can put this on your mobile site. First of all, if you're doing any business, any support or any sales on mobile, put a unique number on your mobile site. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Some of you are probably already doing that. But what you can add on top of this is tap to call. So when people tap on that little blue number at the top here, it will say, do you want to call this number? You should record this in your analytics. The correlation between the amount of people who tap and the amount of people who say call is very, very high. It's like 98, 99%. So what does that get you? Big deal, I've counted the number of calls that we've got. Well, the very interesting thing about this is, if you want to know, what did they do before they called? What keyword did they type into Google? Which keywords give us the most phone calls and the least phone calls? Which pages and paths did they take in the site? You can get keyword level call tracking analysis from your mobile site and it won't cost you any money. What, what it will do is it will help you work out what you're over or under bidding for. So if you're looking to shave money off your PVC budget, this will give you at least 20% off on the right type of site off your costs. And it will tell you what really sucks and what doesn't. Zero cost. You can also do this in desktops. I mean, this is a bit of a crappy way of doing it. So, you know, you, you, you would... You know, when you click on someone's phone number, it actually expands the part of the page. And this one here, when you click on this, it actually reveals the full phone number. But that allows you then to track that someone's about to make a call. It's a clear signal of intent. Um, so it's a good way of doing it. But actually, what I really want you to do is invest in call analytics. It's a paid solution and it allows you to track all your desktop calls your mobile site calls, and if you run print ads or TV ads, it will track all of those too. But this is the interesting graph. In the world of car glass repair, in the USA, there's a 250 times variation from here all the way to these keywords up here in the amount of phone calls that we get from them when people come to the site. And these ones over here are things like emergency replacement, same day, roadside. It's like people who really have an urgent need. So obviously they call a lot more. But our entire PPC bidding strategy was based on the average of this, which is just bullshit. We were totally underbidding for this stuff, and we were totally overbidding for this stuff. And this stuff in the middle is kind of Goldilocks, it's just about right. But you're probably doing this. You're probably over and under bidding for large chunks of your PPC and you don't know it because you're not counting the calls that come in. And if you have this kind of stuff, it will enable you to make great graphs like this that are showing that, you know, people think, oh, you know, this booking rate isn't too good here in, in New Zealand. But hey, wait a minute. Look at the conversion to phone call. The conversion to phone call is much higher than in France. So just comparing the online transactions without the phone call, any ringback service, email, chat, if you're not measuring these other contact channels, you're completely missing out on this kind of data. Here is a list of, um, a complete list of call tracking companies around the world. If you're looking for it in multiple countries, that should probably help you. So what does it get you? You can do it for free. Um, especially on your mobile site. If you do any support sales by phone, you need this stuff. 
And I've seen 20 to 60 percent reductions in PPC spend and the cost of acquisition through optimization. Not good for Google, but great for you. So the future here is going to involve cloud telephony. Imagine a software layer in front of your business that routes the priority calls to people who are going to spend lots of money, the good prospects, that gives people different on hold music or different messages. That kind of software is being built right now. If you want to get in early on this kind of rush in cloud telephony, then have a look at some of these solutions because they'll get you the first step on the ladder. And sadly, out of um, most of my clients that I've looked at this year, their analytics are completely broken in one or more ways. They just didn't know it. Um, so, you know, would you run a department store where the tills didn't record the category of goods being sold? Would you try and improve the UX of a, a car uh, without being able to actually look at any of the instrumentation on the dashboard? And for some of you, you're probably investing the same amount in your e-commerce site to run it as it takes to operate a fighter jet, right? But you wouldn't expect a fighter jet to get up and fly and have dog fights and stuff without having proper instrumentation that actually worked. It's like, oh, we're out of fuel. <laughs> Um, this is not a good sign, so you have to invest in this stuff. Um, get a health check for your analytics is my top bit of advice on this slide. Um, you can try any of these guys or ask me about it. Get someone to check it over and make sure that you're not wildly misinterpreting the data. And, you know, if you're going to go out, if you're a new Formula 1 team, you say, oh, we're going to beat the other guys, but we're going to do it without having proper instrumentation. We'll kind of guess how much fuel we've got. We'll kind of go by feel on how fast it's going around the corners. If you don't have the right performance data, you're not going to win any races with your competitors. So how's it working out for me, all of this stuff, just to kind of round all of this off? Well, all these methodologies and tools, you know, it sounds great on a slide, it doesn't always happen like that in real life. And actually, this stuff is mainly about the mindset of the team and the managers, not just the tools or methodologies you use. You can get great tools, you can assemble a whole orchestra with the best instruments and tell them to play, but it's not going to sound like the Berlin Philharmonic, that's the problem. And not all of my clients have all of these working parts or want to buy all of these tools, but use as many of them as you can. It's a hell of a lot better than just guessing. Just guessing, ego, opinion, cherished notions, these are the favorite tools of website development at the moment. You need to fill something else in their place. And blending lean and agile techniques with conversion optimization, bringing those two together, is my critical insight of the last five years. And the stuff that that netted me is, you can see I was sort of starting out quite slowly at Belron, but we got 5, 10, 15, and 25% increase in the conversion rate of the entire world. So over the time that I was there, we were managing to get over 70% more out of the business. And within six months this year, I took a, a hair salon that has 65 hair, uh, chain of hair salons in London, and I've increased the bookings that that business gets by 65%, and the phone alone by 58%. If you want to find out how, come and ask me afterwards. That has turned their online business from single-figure millions into double-figure millions this year. They are really happy. I wish I had a slice of that money. <laughs> And last but not least, don't overcomplicate this stuff. Do something. Use the JFDI method, the just do it method. And please, I hope after today, and you've seen everybody here, that you go out and you kick some serious conversion ass tomorrow. If you want to get in touch with me or download the slides, I'll upload them later. Thank you very much for your time today. one you can get on, uh, I guess you're not bringing luggage, because I, I gave this, uh, this jam away in the first year, and, and nobody could bring it home, so this, this should do it in the... Thank you uh, very much, okay. enjoy this. Okay. Thanks, you're and there's a special for you, Ooh. because we made a, 
we made a, a conversionista a raspberry case in our 3D oh, printer, and 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 uh, and uh, Craig really wanted us. So here it is. Thank you. I will send you a full <laughs> time. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much.